Father, I would pray that you would lead us, guide us, direct us by your Holy Spirit. Give us special spiritual understanding. And Father, as we go to your word to understand the prophecies of the Bible, as we're looking for understanding, help us also to be open to what your word teaches and to what your will is for our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our topic tonight, the dragon and the woman. And uh, when we look at the title, it sounds like a classic fairy tale. You know, it seems to have all those same elements. There's a fire-breathing dragon. There's a damsel in distress. One would expect to see a hero to come and show up and rescue that damsel in distress. And actually, we will discover that this particular uh, prophecy has all of those elements and more. And it's really interesting as we get into it tonight to learn the things that we will be learning from God's Word in our presentation tonight. Everywhere I travel, I notice that there's churches everywhere, and I think it's great to have churches everywhere because the Bible teaches that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all nations, and then the end will come. But on the other hand, sometimes I've been to some places where you can get into a town where at one intersection in the town you will find uh, various churches, four different churches on the four corners. And uh, all have a different sign in front and all say something a little bit different but all claim to have the truth and it can be a little bit confusing. It reminds me of the story of a young man that I heard. Well, this boy came home from church one day and when he got home from church, lo and behold, there was a gentleman there visiting his family and this gentleman asked him where he had been and he says, well, he said, I've been to church. And the gentleman named a particular church and he said do you go to this church and the little boy said no mister he says I belong to a different abomination now you can see why a little boy would have problems with a great big word am I right uh, but sometimes it can be a little bit confusing for those of us who are adults and and I'd like to suggest to you that God really didn't design that his church would be as fragmented as it is today. I want to point us to Ephesians chapter 4 to begin with tonight. In verse 11 it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. In other words, that you might be equipped for the work of ministry that God has for you, and that you might be edified, built up, and instructed it says till we all come to the what folks to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ now are we there yet no we're not there yet so these gifts are still needed in God's church am I right to bring us into a unity of faith I want you to notice that this unity of faith is not just kind of a watered-down unity it's a high calling to be called Oh, to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, that's a pretty high calling. What do you think? And then it goes on to say this. It says in verse 14 that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. So as we are brought into a unity, we need to be matured, it's telling us. You see? No longer be children. And we need to make sure that we're not carried away with every wind of doctrine that comes by the trickery of men. Uh, one of the things we see here is that we need to know what God's Word teaches. You see, we need to be matured into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ, and we need to be matured in God's Word in such a way that we're not carried about by false doctrine. Now, doctrine simply means teaching, you see. And it's not doctrine that we need to stay away from, it's false doctrine we need to stay away from. Isn't that right? Uh, the doctrine that comes by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness by which they lie and wait to deceive. Throughout the New Testament, throughout the Bible, we have warnings about this kind of teaching. In 2 Peter 2 verse 1, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. You see, in the Old Testament days, there were false prophets, okay? And he's saying, even in the New Testament era, there will be false teachers. And I'd like to suggest there's probably even more today than there were back then what do you think probably so 
goes on to say, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. The Apostle Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. So the one that is behind all of the deception, of course, is Satan or the devil himself. Isn't that correct? He's the one behind it all. And he says, look, Satan can transform himself to appear as an angel of light, so we shouldn't be surprised if his ministers can also appear as ministers of righteousness. You know what that tells me? It tells me you can't always tell by appearances. Isn't that right? That's why I told you last night, don't take my word for anything. You know, take the outline that you get, go home and look up the Bible verses. I want you to do that because that's one of the things that we need to do to make certain that we're not carried away by false teaching. It's kind of interesting to look at the Ten Commandments of God. And that first commandment of God says, you shall have no other gods before me, as we're reading from the New King James Version. God wants us to put him first in our lives. I'd like to suggest to you that God is worthy of our worship that his son Jesus Christ is worthy of our worship but there is another who would interpose himself between us and the Lord Jesus Christ one called the devil known back in the Old Testament known by the name of Lucifer and we read about Lucifer in the book of Isaiah chapter 14 beginning in verse 12 it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like who, folks? Like the Most High. Somebody told me one time that they thought that Lucifer's biggest problem was that he had eye trouble. And I think maybe they're right. What do you think? He keeps saying, I will do this and I will do that. I will be like the Most High. So Lucifer wanted the worship in heaven that belonged to God alone, actually. In heaven, what we find is that there was a rebellion in heaven, and that rebellion was really a battle for the throne, and that the battle that got started there for the throne of God actually got transferred here to planet Earth. Do you remember that in the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, that the devil actually tempted Jesus in the area of worship? That's one of the temptations that came to him. I want you to notice what he said in Matthew 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Notice what he's showing him. He's showing him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Now, notice what he says to him. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will do what? if you will fall down and worship me. We need to understand what's going on here. Jesus Christ came to planet Earth, and we know he came to planet Earth to die on the cross of Calvary to save us from our sin, but we need to also recognize that he came to rescue a fallen planet. And what the devil is saying to Jesus in this temptation is he's saying, listen, you don't have to go through everything you think you have to go through to get this planet back. He says, all you have to do is fall down and worship me and I'll give it all to you now. Did you know that the devil is called the prince of this world? You know why he's called that? Would well, you remember in the Garden of Eden that God gave to Adam and Eve dominion over this world? But they lost that dominion when they succumbed to the temptation of the devil there in the Garden of Eden. And so what the devil is doing is he's saying to Jesus, he's saying, there's an easier way than God's way. In fact, the devil would say that to everyone today. And it seems like he's being quite successful in our society, quite successful in telling our society, you don't need to follow God's word, there's an easier way than doing it God's way. Have you noticed that? Most of our society has bought into that idea, haven't they? Thinking that there's an easier way than God's way. So he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, 
You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Now here's an important point. Jesus was safe from the temptation of the devil because number one, he knew the true teaching of the word of God. And number two, he was determined to live according to the word of God. And I'd like to suggest to you, to make sure that we're not carried about by every wind of doctrine, that we need to know the true teachings of the Word of God, you see, and that we need to make a determination in our lives to also live according to the teachings of the Word of God. What do you think? And that will really help us to be free from those false teachings. Now, we're going to the book of Revelation tonight. We're going to Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to study about the vision of the dragon and the woman. Actually, Revelation chapter 12 has 17 verses. We're going to study all of them tonight, but not in direct order, 1 through 17. And the reason we're not going to do it that way is because we're going to take it topically because we find different symbols introduced and what we want to do is learn the identity and the role that these symbols or these players in the story have and John is seeing things in vision as he sees the things in vision some of those things are all taking place at maybe simultaneously and so he's got to write it down in a way to make sense of it for the readers and he follows a format here in this chapter. Well, it's not much unlike the format one of our newspaper reporters might take today. You know, if a newspaper reporter reports on a story, when you read the opening paragraph in the story, you find out what happened. You get the nuts and bolts of what happened, right? Then as you read the next paragraphs, what you do is you get additional information that fills out the story. That's what we have in Revelation chapter 12. We have an opening paragraph. It's actually the first six verses where we get the nuts and bolts of what it was that he saw. And then from verse 7 through 17, we get an expanded view that gives us additional details of what he saw. And so we're going to kind of study it in that manner. And a couple of times along the way when we jump from the capsule portion to the expanded view or from the expanded view back to the capsule portion, I'll kind of point this out for us here tonight let's start in revelation 12 verse 1 now a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars now there's a lot in that verse but rather than getting caught up in every detail let's simply focus on the symbol of the woman here in revelation chapter 12 and what is this woman representing going to the old testament prophecies in jeremiah 6 verse 2 it says i have likened the daughter of zion to a lovely and delicate what Woman. So a woman here is used to represent the daughter of Zion. What's Zion all about? Well, in Isaiah 51, 16, it says, Say to Zion, you are what? My people. Now that's in the Old Testament, the woman represents God's people, but it's also true in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So the woman is used in both the Old and New Testaments to represent God's people, and that's what we will see here, is that the woman truly represents God's people. So that's the symbol of the woman let's move to another symbol and learn a little bit more about the woman in verse 2 it says then being with child she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth so this woman is a pregnant woman right and she's just about ready to give birth she's in labor you see and we're going to find out about her child it says in verse 5 and she bore what kind of a child a male child now it says this male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So let's look at the symbol of the male child. Who is it that is represented by the male child? Before we just kind of jump to a conclusion, let us notice that the verse gives us two identifying characteristics for the male child. Number one, this male child is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And number two, this male child is to be caught up to God into his throne. Am I right? It's kind of interesting. Right here in the book of Revelation, we can find the application of the first 
identifying characteristic. Revelation 19 verse 15 it says now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations the he is Jesus and he himself will rule them with a what folks with a rod of iron. It's the rider of the white horse Jesus Christ himself who will rule all nations with a rod of iron. Also he's caught up to God into his throne. Hebrews 8 verse 1 says now this is the main point of the things we are saying we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty where folks in the heavens. So Jesus has been caught up to God and to his throne, am I right? So let's understand that the male child represents none other than Jesus Christ himself. In other words, Jesus is the hero of this story. He's the one who rescues the damsel in distress. We'll see that as we go along here tonight. In verse 3, we find another symbol. It says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. Now, we're not going to look at all of those things, but let's look at the symbol of the dragon and what is it that is represented by the dragon. Well, let me tell you right now, it's going to be so plain when we read it that you can't miss it that the dragon represents none other than the devil or Satan himself, okay? Now let's notice what we learn starting in the expanded view now in verse 7. It says, and war broke out where? In heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. Whenever there's a, a war, there's always two sides, right? So you got Michael and his angels on one side. Let's suffice it to say that Michael is the commander-in-chief of the angels of heaven. And then you've got the dragon and his angels on the other side. Notice what it says. They did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So if there's no place in heaven, what's going to happen? Well, it tells us in verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of where, folks? out of heaven that serpent of old called the devil and Satan I told you to be very clear who he is the one who deceives the what the whole world he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him now there's an awful lot in this Bible verse and we're gonna take some time with it tonight and actually come back to it a little bit later and look at it again notice it says that the dragon was cast out and then it refers to him as that serpent of old the dragon in Revelation is the same as the serpent of old. When was the dragon or the devil appearing as a serpent? Back in the Garden of Eden. Here in Revelation chapter 12, it's like John in giving the description is taking a red pen and pointing an arrow to say, go back and look in the book of Genesis to find out more about this particular one. It says... The great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Then it says he does, he does what? He deceives how much? Come on. The whole world. I want you to understand something about the devil. He wants to deceive the whole world. Okay? He really does. And it says he was cast to the earth. His angels were cast out with him. Um, a lot of times people have the idea that everything here in the book of Revelation, including here in Revelation chapter 12, is all still in the future. But I want to show you something that Jesus said about the devil. I want you to see it in Luke 10 verse 18. It says, And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now what does that mean when he says, I saw him fall like lightning from heaven? That's past tense, isn't that right? When Jesus was here on earth, he said, I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. How could he have seen him? Well, he was there, wasn't he, folks? Yeah, he was there, and he saw him fall like lightning from heaven. So this is an important point. You see, the devil was cast to the earth. His angels were cast out with him, and he's here trying to deceive the whole world. How many of you have ever had the devil give you a hard time? Okay. Okay. Uh, and I saw some of you didn't raise your hands, but I have a feeling it's just hard to get you to raise your hands. Here's my question. If all of this is still in the future, why is the devil here now giving us such a hard time? You understand what I'm saying? 
because he is still here, isn't that right? He is here now. And I see a lot of hands go up when I say, how many of you have had the devil give you a hard time? And, well, you know, he's here and he's alive and well. He wants to deceive how much, folks? The whole world. Oh, I have another question for you. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, do you think the devil just gives up? Huh? You think he just gives up and says, that's it? No, he doesn't. I'd like to suggest that maybe even he works a little harder. Uh, you know, there's a, a story from the Old South during the time of slavery where there's, there's this man who was a slave that was a Christian. And he sang some songs of his experience and the troubles of life, and his master was not a Christian. His master would chide him when be, his slave would try to tell him that he ought to be a Christian and give his life to God. And he'd say, well, why would I ever want to be a Christian? I don't have all the problems you've got. And you hear you're a Christian, you've got all these problems. I don't want to be a Christian. And the slave didn't know what to say. One day they were out hunting ducks. And when his master shot the ducks out of the air, it was the slave's job to go pick them up. And uh, with one shot of the shotgun, three ducks fell out of the air. Now, one of them fell dead. Two of them were injured. The one that fell dead fell with a thud. You know what I mean? And the two that were injured, they kind of fell fluttering to the ground. And when they hit the ground, they tried to run off into the brush. And the slave who had to go pick them up, he went as quick as he could to get the two that were injured, trying to get them out of the brush before they got away. And then he took his time and came back and picked up the one that was dead. And then he knew what he was going to say to his master. And the next time his master said to him, well, why would I ever want to be a Christian? Because I don't have all of the problems like you. And the slaves told his master, he says, well... The relationship between you, me, and the devil is sort of like me and those ducks that you shot down. He said, when you shot those ducks, there were three ducks. There were two that were still alive, scrambling in the brush. One was dead. He says, I didn't have to worry about the one that was dead. I knew I could pick that one up any time. So I went, at, first of all, after the ones that were trying to get away to catch them before they got away. And he says, that's the way it is with you, me, and the devil. The devil knows I'm trying to get away, and so he's really after me, but he's not worried about you because he knows you're a dead duck already. You see the point, folks? The devil sometimes will even work harder when we've given our life to Jesus to try to deceive us, to try to get us off track. And so we need to understand some of these things here tonight. Uh, did God create earth merely as a dumping off place for Satan? No, we've talked about the fact that God created the world, made it a very perfect place, and he said to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. But then the dragon showed up as the serpent of old. Okay, He showed up there in the garden, in the midst of the garden at that tree, and there he was when Eve came by and got into a discussion with Eve. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, notice what the devil does. I want you to understand that the devil hasn't changed his tactics a whole lot. First thing he does with Eve is he gets her to question what God has said. You see that? Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And then notice what Eve says. Eve stands there and tries to carry on a conversation with the serpent. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. I have a question for you. Did Eve know she was not to eat of that tree? Yes. Important point. Just knowing the truth isn't good enough. Am I right? You see, she needed to, like Jesus, not only know the truth, but be determined to follow it. And uh, she knew the truth, but that's kind of as far as it went. Notice what the serpent said. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now here God has said, you will die, and then the serpent said, oh no, you won't really. Now, who, do, who do you suppose she ought to believe? You ought to believe God, right? 
He goes on to say, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, actually, what the serpent says to Eve is, he says, listen, rather than dying, actually, if you listen to me rather than listening to God, you will have a better life. Did you know that there's a lot of people in our society today who believe that they will have a better life if they ignore what God says in his word? Hmm? There's a lot of people who believe that, but I'd like to tell you and testify to the fact that the best life you can have is by following the teachings of this book. You see, that's really the truth. And notice what he does. He even gets her to the point tempting her with what got him into trouble. He says, God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be what? Like God. Now there's a little bit of truth to what he said, because to be a good lie, it has to have some truth. He says, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And it is true that when she ate of the tree, for the first time she came to a knowledge of evil. I'd like to suggest it's a knowledge we all would have been better off without. What do you think? So God's not trying to withhold something good from her. He's trying to protect her, you see. And so we find this deception as a result of the deception of the devil, who is a deceiver. Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden. And then God gave a curse. A curse to the woman, a curse to the man, a curse to the serpent. Let's look at the curse to the serpent in Genesis 3, beginning in verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And when it talks of her seed, notice what it says next. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now here's an interesting point. He says there's going to be enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He says her seed is a he. When he comes, he's going to bruise your head, but you're only going to bruise his heel. Hmm. Here's what I want you to understand. The seed of the woman in Genesis chapter 3 is the same as the male child in Revelation chapter 12. It's none other than Jesus Christ. The woman in Revelation chapter 12 is symbolic of God's people. The woman in Genesis chapter 3, of course, is Eve, the mother of all the human race. Isn't that correct? Yeah. And here's a more significant thing. The dragon of Revelation chapter 12 is the same as the serpent of Genesis chapter 3. Mm-hmm. This is the first prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, the first prophecy of the fact that the promised Messiah would one day come. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now what I want you to understand is the devil was warned that Jesus was on the way. Isn't that right? He was warned that the seed of the woman was coming and that the seed of the woman would do to him worse than he would do to, her, to him. Isn't that right? Hmm. Let's come back to this. Revelation 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth. His angels were cast out, what? With him. So when he was cast to the earth... His angels were cast out with him. You see, the reason that the devil has become the prince of this world is because Adam and Eve have given in to that temptation back in the Garden of Eden. Um, have you ever wondered how many of the angels of heaven succumbed to the temptation of the devil and were cast out? If you go back to the capsule portion, we can find out. In verse 4 it says... His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now notice, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. You go to Revelation chapter 1 and at the end of the chapter you'll discover that stars are used as symbols to represent angels. 
So if stars are symbols to represent angels, then here the symbolism shows that it's a third of the angels that succumb to the deception of the devil. Now understand this. Those angels had access to the very presence of God in heaven, right? And if a third of the angels were deceived by the devil, that would tell me that the devil is a master deceiver. What do you think? He's a master deceiver. So we need to be aware of that point. And then it says, The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. You see, back in Genesis 3, verse 15, the serpent was sold. The devil was told the seed of the woman is coming. And from that time forward, he stood by with every ounce of his determination and watchfulness waiting for this promised seed of the woman to appear. Hmm. He wanted to devour the promised seed of the woman, the male child of Revelation chapter 12. You know the story in the Bible, how Jesus was born, and then the Shepherds came and saw him that night and then later on there were three wise men that came searching for Jesus and it, on their quest to find Jesus they went to the leaders of the Jewish people they went to King Herod who said I don't know where he is but when you find him come let me know so I can go and worship him yeah right you know he didn't want to worship him right and so what happened was they went on and they found him and they worshipped, but they were told by the Lord, don't go back to King Herod. Go another route to go home. And so King Herod, when he found out that he had been deceived by the wise men, he sent the soldiers in to destroy all of the male children two years of age and younger. Do you see how the devil works? The devil will do anything he can to thwart the cause of God. Isn't that correct? Now, I want you to notice the deceptions of the devil. Number one, we found out that there is a deception in heaven because a third of the angels have been thrown out with him, and he's active in that deception. We find that in the Garden of Eden, he takes on the form of a serpent to deceive Eve. We find in the wilderness, he goes personally to try to deceive and tempt Jesus in the wilderness, maybe even appearing as an angel of light, as the Apostle Paul tells us he can do that. And here, in this instance, he uses uses the established government of that day to try to accomplish his purpose to kill Jesus as soon as he was born. But you know, the good news is that God had warned Joseph to leave and to take Mary and the child and go down to Egypt. And so they were safe in Egypt when the soldiers of Herod went in to kill all of the male children. But did the devil give up then? Huh? No, we saw that he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. When Jesus did not succumb to the temptation, later on, we find that he uses the established leaders of the religion of that day to bring false accusations and bring him into a, an unjust trial, actually. And there he is mocked and scorned. He is forced to carry a cross up the hill to Golgotha. There he's nailed upon that cross. There he is crucified. He dies upon that cross. He's taken down from the cross and he's sealed up in a tomb because the devil's been waiting for him ever since Genesis chapter 3. The devil's been ready. And I'd like to suggest to you something. I'd like to suggest to you that on the day of the crucifixion, when Jesus was sealed up in a tomb and they put a stone in front of it and set a seal on it and set soldiers out there to guard it, I have a feeling that the devil and his angels had a party. What do you think? I bet you they're having a great celebration. Why? Because they think they have won the decisive battle in the war that got started in heaven and got transferred here to planet Earth. And so I can imagine the party that the devil and the angels were having, but I want to thank God that three days later, Jesus Christ rose from the tomb. Aren't you glad for that? Now, yeah, go ahead. That's all right. Yeah, I'm glad that he rose from the tomb. And let me tell you something. 
the devil's party ended. Mm Mm-hmm. I want you to understand this. When Jesus Christ came forth victorious from the tomb, the devil knew his days were numbered. We're going to read that here in this chapter, okay, in Revelation chapter 12. Uh, Let's come back to it and let's notice what it says. In Revelation 12 verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been what? Cast down. Now I want to help you to understand that this isn't talking about when he was initially cast out of heaven. Here it's saying, now he is cast down. You see, we find that he's been cast out of heaven because here he is in the Garden of Eden bringing deception. But you find in the book of Job that he still has access to the counsels of God showing up representing planet Earth. Read it in the first two chapters of the book of Job and you'll see that indeed he did. But you know, eventually he's going to be completely cast down. And by now he has been Let me share with you something else Jesus said. We read how he talked about the fact that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's past tense. I want you to notice this in John 12, verse 31. He said, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be what? Will be cast out. Oh, he said, I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. That's when he was initially cast out. But now, he says, is the judgment of this world. And he's actually talking in reference to the time of his crucifixion. When he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Notice verse 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Isn't that interesting? It's an obvious reference to his crucifixion. And he says, this will be the time when the devil is actually judged. And it's kind of interesting that nowhere in Scripture after the time of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus do we find any reference in any of the prophecies of the Bible that the devil has any more access to the counsels of God. Hmm. Very interesting. Look at this. We found out that the male child would be caught up to God and to his throne. Isn't that right? It's true. After his resurrection, Jesus did ascend to the Father in heaven. Isn't that correct? Revelation 12, verse 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. And I'd like to suggest to you that when Jesus ascended to his Father, there was a wonderful, tremendous celebration in heaven. What do you think? A wonderful celebration to welcome Christ back to the heavenly courts. The one who has been victorious in his mission to planet earth. But you see, I want you to see what else this verse says. While there's joy and rejoicing in heaven, look what it says about here on earth. It says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. Why? For the devil has come down to you having what, folks? Great wrath because he knows that he has a what? A short time. You see, when Jesus ascended from the tomb and ascended to his Father in heaven, the devil knew his days were numbered. It says he has great wrath. Now, does that mean he's just mildly annoyed? No, 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 no. I asked this question down in Salisbury a few years ago, and the lady on the front row said, No, he's ticked! I think maybe she was right. What do you think? Yeah. He has great wrath. He knows that he has a short time. And so he's trying to deceive how much of the world? The world. Hmm. Great wrath. Knows he has a short time. His days are numbered. Now, here's an important point. If you know you're doomed, there's one of two responses you can have. Either you can get so depressed about it, you sit around and you end up taking your life. Or you become suicidal at least. Okay. The other thing is that you could get so busy doing other stuff that you don't have time to think about it. Guess which one of the two the devil has chosen. He's not sitting around being depressed. He's busy doing other stuff. You know what the other stuff is, don't you? 
trying to deceive the whole world. That's what it's all about. It reminds me of these two little boys. Uh, you know, they had a grandmother. And the grandmother was known everywhere as someone who would never, ever say anything bad about anybody. Hey, wouldn't it be great if we all had that kind of reputation? Don't you think? Mm, yeah. So one little boy said to the other little boy, Hey, I know how I can get Grandma to say something bad about someone. And the little boy said, How are you going to do that? He said, You come with me, I'll show you. They got over to Grandma's house, and one little boy said to Grandma, He said, Grandma, what do you think of the devil? She thought for a moment, and she said, He sure is a hard worker, isn't he? <laughs> now you think about that for just a moment. If you can come up with something good to say about the devil... Can't you come up with something good to say about everybody? Huh? What do you think? Have you ever heard the saying that goes like this? If you can't think of anything good to say, how does it end? Don't say anything at all. That is the worst saying of all. Because if you can't think of anything good to say and you don't say anything at all, then what you're doing is you're sitting there thinking all of those evil things. Okay, so I'm on a quest. I want you to help me with this. We need to change that saying to, if you can't think of anything good to say about someone, say something good about Jesus. Amen. You see what that does? That changes your thoughts. And if you change your thoughts, you know what? You change your whole outlook on life. And I think we'd be better off thinking about Jesus anyway. What do you think? Okay. Oh, that was extra, you know. Uh, we don't even pass the bucket for the offering a second time for that. Um, let's get back to our prophecy. Chapter 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, not just cast out but cast down because he's been defeated in the decisive battle for the entire war. You know, every war has more than one battle. But the decisive battle is at the cross. The decisive battle is when is won when Jesus comes victorious from the tomb. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Now why does he persecute the woman who gave birth to the male child? I'll tell you why. Because the male child has been caught up to God into his throne. He can't get at him any longer. So who does he go after? The ones who are closest to him. The way to hurt Jesus is to hurt his followers. And so we find this in the early Christian church. You see, the devil deceiving the whole world, he's going out persecuting the woman. Jesus has been caught up to God and to his throne. The devil can't get at him, so he goes after the followers of Jesus. In Acts chapter 7, we read about Stephen, the first Christian martyr who is stoned, you see. And the persecution arose early in the church. In Acts 8 verse 1 it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. It was a persecution that was meant by the devil to destroy the church. But instead of destroying the church, it scattered them so they carried the gospel to other parts of the world. Isn't that kind of interesting? That which was designed by the devil to destroy the church actually spread the gospel. Isn't it interesting how God can take bad things and make something good out of them? It really is. Okay, Revelation 12 verse 11 tells us this. The followers of Jesus, it says, they overcame him, the dragon, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the what, folks? To the death. Oh, there were those who were willing to die rather than to dishonor the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to suggest to you that all of us ought to have that kind of courage and have that kind of faith in Jesus that we're willing to die in order to stand true to the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you think? Hmm. But persecution arose in the early church. Well, let's look at it here in Revelation 12, verse 6. The persecution didn't just last during the first century of the church. It says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. I want you to take a close look at this verse and notice the phrases. Notice that the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there, 
and for a period of time, 1,260 days. So we see these four elements of the verse, okay? Going to the wilderness, a place prepared by God to be fed there, and for this period of time, 1,260 days. Now this is the last verse of the capsule portion. When we get in the expanded portion, we find this same thing spoken of, and the way that we can know it's exactly the same because a lot of times people think it's two separate time periods, but folks, it's one and the same because we'll notice the same four things. Okay, notice it here. Um, first of all, let's put this up. The woman flees to the wilderness for a period of 1260 days. Revelation 12, 14, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. Now the symbolism is slightly different, but it's the same four things. That she might fly into the what? wilderness to her what to her place verse 15 where she is what nourished or fed for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent so here the time period is expressed as time times and half a time where before it was expressed as 1260 days what's a time in the bible a time is a year what we have is three and a half years, time, times, and half a time. The biblical years having 360 days through these years, three and a half times 360 comes out to what, folks? 1260 days. And folks, what we're really talking about is that talking about the same time period, all four of the same elements in reference to both of them. I'm going to introduce to you a principle tonight, a principle of prophetic interpretation that we're not going to even, well, let me say it this way, that we're only going to introduce tonight. Here's a principle of prophetic interpretation that we're just going to introduce tonight. Actually, we're going to validate it in our study on Monday night, and we're going to put it, put it to further use in the days coming ahead in some of our other studies that we're going to go through. Now, this is a principle that's not new with me. It's been around for a number of centuries within the Christian church. It goes back to the time of, of the Protestant Reformation. People like Martin Luther and others from that time forward continue to use this principle. Sir Isaac Newton, who was not only a scientist but a Bible student, used this principle, as did John Wesley and others. Um, but let me share with you the principle. It's expressed in two different passages in the Bible. First of all, in the book of Numbers. Do you remember when the children of Israel came up to spy out the land before they entered in? The spies all came back with an evil report except for two of them. And then they didn't want to go. And so God told them that they'd have to go wander out in the wilderness. Let's look at what he said in Numbers 14, verse 34. It says, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. So here, the 40 days would become 40 years. Am I correct? And it's really kind of a prophecy of what he would do with them. And also in Ezekiel 4, verse 6, he says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. And so what we're looking at here with the 1260 prophetic days is we're looking at 1260 literal years. We're letting a day represent a year in symbolic Bible prophecy. Now, understand that we only do this in symbolic Bible prophecy. And so what we're doing is letting these 1260 days represent 1260 literal years. So they would flee to the wilderness for 1260 days or 1260 years. That 1260 year period is really the time that the church is in the wilderness through the time of the Middle Ages. And there was persecution of God's people all through the time of the Middle Ages. Um, many historians have suggested that over 50 million Christians were martyred during this time. Uh, it's kind of interesting that people, if they even had the Bible, could be martyred because of wanting to and desiring to have the Bible for themselves because the church established at that time was saying, we the church will read the Bible and we will tell you what it says. Um, but you know what? There were those who gave their life for God's Word and for following the principles of God's Word. In Revelation 12, verse 15, it tells us this, So the serpent 
spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now we need to understand here the symbolism that is being used to talk about the serpent spewing water out of his, out of his mouth like a flood to sweep away the woman by the flood. Okay? There's a clue in Revelation 17, verse 15. We're not going to read it tonight. We'll read it actually coming up, on a, I think, on Thursday night. We'll read that passage. But in that passage, there is a woman upon many waters. And then later on in verse 15, it says, The waters where you saw the woman seated represent peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Now, if the water there represents people, then let's understand this flood represents the people or the armies that the devil would send to search out God's people who have fled to the wilderness to try to destroy them. So this is a symbolic flood, a symbolic flood of persecution that we're seeing. Verse 16 says, too, that the earth helped the woman... And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Now how could the earth help the woman in swallowing up the flood? Well, because the woman was fleeing into the wilderness and they, the followers of God, would flee into the mountains and hide in mountains and caves to escape the persecution that came during this time. You can go to Europe and you can find the place and you can even visit the places where the Bible-believing Waldensians went during this time of persecution, during the time of the Middle Ages to escape this religious persecution. You can go to the hidden Waldensian mountain villages where they lived. You can see the homes that they lived in. You can see where they worked. You can see the tables where they copied the Bible one page at a time by hand. Now, you see, it was forbidden for the people to have the Bible, but they wanted to follow the teachings of the Word of God, and they wanted to get the Bible into the hands of people everywhere, and so they would work laboriously to copy the pages of the Bible one page at a time if they made any mistake they would have to destroy the whole page and start over. How did they get it out to people? What they would do is sew it in the hems of their garments, in the hems of their children's garments, and as they would travel from place to place, that's how they'd get a few pages of Scripture to other people in other places. By the way, you can go over in the summertime just west of Hickory, go over on I-40 to Valdez, North Carolina, and they have an outdoor drama that depicts the persecution of the Waldensian people. Uh, but it's kind of interesting here in the Carolinas, we have some more history beside that. You can go down to Charleston, South Carolina, and if you go down there and take the downtown tour, one of the tours, they'll take you by a number of historic churches in downtown Charleston. It's kind of interesting to see this one is a church of the Huguenots. Well, the French Protestant Church Huguenot organized about 1681. First church built in 1687. This building, the third on this site, was erected in 1845. And the Huguenots in France were also coming to North America to escape religious persecution. And it's kind of interesting if you take some of the other tours and tour some of the big historic homes in downtown Charleston, you'll discover that some of those were built by the Huguenots as they came escaping this religious persecution. So it's it's kind of interesting how we have that history right here in the Carolinas. We come now to Revelation 12, verse 17. How many verses did I say are in the chapter? 17. So that means we're at the last verse of the chapter. The last verse of this chapter that talks about the dragon's role in making war against the woman. Notice what it says. And the dragon was what? Come on enraged with the woman. Now he's still not just mildly annoyed, am I right? Okay. The dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. What does that mean? With those of her offspring who are living down at the end of time. That's what it's talking about. The rest of her offspring. It's talking about you and me in this day, I believe. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring. They're identified as those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, one of the things that we noted along the way tonight 
is that the devil is a deceiver and that the devil tried to get Eve in the Garden of Eden to disbelieve God and to believe him. Isn't that correct? Hmm. You know what? The devil's still doing that. He's still trying to deceive the whole world. And you know what really makes the devil angry? It's when God's people refuse to be deceived and determined to be faithful to God and to his word. And I've come to a conclusion... I've come to the conclusion that it's good for the devil to be angry with me. I know some of you are sitting there going, what do you mean? Let me say it another way. I don't believe it's good for the devil to be pleased with me. What do you think? Okay. And so what we need to do is we need to understand that it's all right for the devil to be angry with us. And don't worry about it if he's angry with you because here's a good point. I want you to get this point. Jesus has already defeated the devil. Isn't that right? Uh, I've I got to use this, this Bible verse. I hear people misquote a Bible verse. Have you ever heard people say this? And they misquote the verse by saying that the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, it does say that, but I call it a misquote. You know why I call it a misquote? Because it's only the last half of the verse. that left out the first half of the verse. Now, if you just go with resist the devil and he will flee from you, I want you to understand something. The devil's not a bit afraid of you. Am I right? I mean, he's whooped you a whole bunch of times already. Isn't that correct? Okay, now here's a good point. The whole verse starts with this. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The way to resist the devil is to get really close to God. That's the way to resist the devil. Okay. Now let me give you an, an analogy for this that will help. Let's suppose that you're a kid on the playground and the bully is always there at the playground beating you up. And one day you decide you're going to resist the bully. Yeah, right. He's going to beat you up again, am I right? But if you go to the playground with your big brother who's already beaten up the bully, I have a feeling the bully will leave you alone. What do you think? Okay, did you get that idea? Who's our big brother? Jesus, okay? Go there with Jesus. Get real close to him. Oh, i got to come back and talk about this. I'm getting too excited. I, I'm forgetting what i got to talk about. What I want you to see is that there is the rest of her offspring. Mm. And so what we discover is that he's angry with the woman. I want to read a verse from the King James Version because I want to use the term that's there. Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the what? the remnant of her seed, those who are remaining faithful at the end. They're identified as those which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so he's angry with the woman. He goes to make war with the remnant. They're identified as those that keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. A number of years ago, I did a theological study in the book of Revelation regarding this phrase, the testimony of Jesus. And I found out that it's often coupled with another phrase like it is here to keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus other place it's the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and I want to show you something it's in Revelation chapter 1 you'll find this interesting notice what John tells us in Revelation 1 verse 1 it says the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Now this is telling us how we got the book of Revelation, that God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it in symbol form to the angel, and then the angel gave it to John. So John is a prophet of God, isn't that right? The angel gives it to John in vision, you see. What does John do with it? who bore witness to the word of God and to the what? The testimony of Jesus Christ and all things that he saw. It says later in this chapter that John is exiled on the island of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now just for a little while, I want you to leave the 21st century. 
Go back with me to the year A.D. 96. Join John on the island of Patmos. Put yourself in his sandals in his day. And help me here. To John in his day, what is the word of God and what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Hmm, are you thinking about it? What is the word of God to John? To John, the word of God is the Old Testament scripture. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. What's the testimony of Jesus to John? The testimony of Jesus to John, you see, is all that he has heard from Jesus as he was a disciple of Jesus. It's all that he's receiving as a prophet of God, receiving it there on the island of Patmos. It's the New Testament revelation that he's receiving. So what we discover about John is that John is faithful to God, exiled on the island of Patmos because he wants to be true to the word of God, the Old Testament scriptures, and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, the New Testament scriptures. He wants to be true to it all. I'd like to suggest that we ought to be true to God's word too. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard people say, well, I believe it from cover to cover? Folks, I think we ought to not just believe it. I think we ought to live according to it. What do you think? And you see, that's what really makes the devil angry when we live according to it. Uh, the next verse is a v verse we really need to take a look at. It's verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and what else? And keep those things which are written in it for the time is what? Near. Near. Have you ever heard somebody say to you, oh, you don't need to worry about studying the book of Revelation. It'll only confuse you. Huh? Have you ever heard that one? Or do people say, oh, you don't want to study it. It'll just confuse you, and you can't really understand it anyway. Hmm. Did you notice something? It says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Now, this is the only book of the Bible that in the opening paragraphs we are told that we will have an explicit blessing if we will read it hear it and keep it hmm? so understand something when people say to you don't study the book of revelation and it'll only confuse you or if they say to you oh don't study the book of revelation because you don't need to know that anyway understand what that is that is the devil trying to rob you of the blessing that god has in store I believe God at his word. How about you? Okay. And I believe if there's a blessing to be had, we ought to look for that blessing. Don't you think so? Sure. Now, I want you to notice something. It says you get a blessing if you'll read it, hear it, and keep it. It doesn't say that you'll get the blessing if you just read it and hear it. Hmm? Okay. Oh, what did we learn er earlier? Jesus was safe from the temptation of the devil because, number one, he knew the truth of God's word, and number two, he lived according to it. What got Eve in, in trouble was the fact that she knew what God said, but she didn't live according to it. Isn't that right? Hmm. So here's an important point. Oh, this is the introduction to the book of Revelation. A little bit later on, we'll be talking about the structure that the book of Revelation has, a definite structure. This is the introduction. In the introduction, it says, you'll be blessed if you read it, hear it, and what else? Keep it. You know, do you know what it says in the conclusion? I want you to see it. It's Revelation 22, verse 7. It says, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who, what? keeps the words of the prophecy of this book in the introduction it says you'll be blessed if you read it hear it and keep it and it leaves out read and hear it just says you'll be blessed if you keep it i guess he figures if he got here you've already read it and heard it what do you think the emphasis is upon what folks upon keep the things that are in it so one of the things we will notice as we go along is that the messages of the book of revelation are messages that are meant to be understood so that we might keep the things that are in it mm, some important things that we're going to learn but let's come back to this final verse of revelation 12 verse 17 when the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And like I was saying earlier, I've just come to the conclusion that I just want to make the devil as angry as I can. 
And I've determined that it's great to be among one of those who is determined to be faithful to all of God's word and that I want to stand for the commandments of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. How many of you tonight with me would just like to raise your hand and say, yeah, I want to make the devil angry too. I'd like to be among those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, you've seen our hands go up. Help us not to just determine to make the devil angry, but help us to please you in all ways. Help us to be faithful in keeping your commandments and receiving the testimony of Jesus Christ. And help us to be faithful to you and to your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.